So I think you can go ahead and start, David. Okay, thank you very much, Emily. So welcome to everybody uh, this afternoon. This is the first in a series of four cyber seminars that Quasi is giving to introduce the national water model. Uh, next week it'll be David Gosch is talking about the Wirf Hydro framework, then Adnan Rajiv and Pierre Onglin will talk about the result of the 20 16 Summer Institute, and then finally I and the other theme leaders of the 2017 Summer Institute will talk on October 27th. So today our speaker, uh, we want to welcome Ed Clark. Ed is the Director of the Geointelligence Program uh, at the National Water Centre in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, um, and he's uh, leading our effort there and been the principal person with whom we have been collaborating as we've been putting on these Summer Institutes at the National Water Centre. He's today going to talk about uh, the national water model itself and the program that NOAA has to launch the national water model across the country. Uh, Ed, uh, please continue. Great. Thank you so much, David. And I will say that uh, for those of you who do not know the background for the Summer Institute and the Innovators Program, this is the brainchild of, of Dr. Maidman and has been a wonderful opportunity for us to collaborate with the academic community. Uh, today on the phone I have with us representatives from the uh, hopefully 13 river forecast centers across the country. And for those of you who are, who are not familiar with uh, NOAA and the water program, within NOAA uh, there are multiple line offices, many of which deal with water and uh, in some aspects of water, whether it's the National Marine Fisheries, the National Ocean Service, or my agency, the National Weather Service, who includes uh, not only the National Water Center, but uh, 13 river forecast centers around the country that do the operational forecasting uh, for the nation uh, to really enforce two aspects of our programmatic authorizations. One is the protection of life and property, and the other is the benefit of the economy. Um, so we're, we're pleased to have our colleagues from the field today, and we'll be incorporating them throughout the process of planning, executing, and then really having fun down here next summer uh, as we uh, execute the Summer Institute. So I'm going to talk today about uh, some of the programmatic uh, elements that are really allowing us to do this. Uh, certainly one of the big components of this is the National Water Center, but it's also a discussion about how NOAA is responding to uh, increasing change and demands on water resources, water information, uh, and what we as an agency uh, with multiple different aspects of a water-related mission are doing to respond to that. We'll talk about these emphases for change. I'll talk a little bit about water at NOAA. We'll talk about the uh, National Water Center and specifically the Innovators Program, the mechanism by which we can engage with academia and graduate students. And then I'll talk about the National Water Model itself. Um, I hope to have time for questions at the end, so if you have some during the conversation, please type them in, and I understand that Liz will, uh, will read them aloud to us as we go forward. So I think all of us who are in the water field, whether it be emerging uh, graduate students, uh, late uh, graduate, uh, undergraduate students uh, going to the final year of their, their studies, uh, those of us who practice on the federal side as well as the public side, we see multiple threats to our nation's water. Um, it's a threat from increasing population growth and economic development, uh, stressing water supplies and increasing vulnerability. We certainly see that with the increasingly complex climate and climate change, it's impacting water availability, quality, and uncertainty. Uh, we're seeing an aging infrastructure and water resources, uh, mechanisms that 100 years ago delivered clean and adequate water supply. Today, those are failing. And then the socioeconomic risks of floods and droughts, uh, whether it be the flooding in Texas last year, the flooding recently in, outside of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and the Amy River Basin, are really uh, straining our, our economies and our communities. So we face a number of these what we call grand challenges. And I would say to students just finishing their degrees that there has never been a better time uh, to engage in water science, to look at a career in water resources management, water resources forecasting. Public sector is just one aspect of that. There's certainly rich tracks in the private sector and academic sector. And through this program, the Innovators Program, we hope to integrate all three. Further impacting and, and um, uh, ad adversely uh, stressing the, the water challenges is the climate uh, uh, challenge, climate uh, issue. Um, clearly evidence of human-induced climate change or straining water impacts across the U.S. The National Climate Assessment of 2014 uh, focuses in clearly on extreme weather patterns, the, the incre increasing frequency and or the intensity. These include things like prolonged periods of heat, heavy precipitation and flooding, 
mobilization of sediment and contaminants into water quality, or water uh, basins, rivers, lakes, streams, and, all, and then out to the coast and ocean um, estuaries. And of course, if you live in the Intermountain West or even California, drought is, is becoming almost a, a, a portion of life, um, a, a component of life in those, in those regions. So again, it's, 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 a, it's a myriad of, of challenges and potential hurdles, all of which uh, relate to um, NOAA's uh, mission in one way, shape, or form. Further building on this water streams, not just flooding, but drought, this notion of water security. In 2015, the National Security uh, Council met and recognized for really one of the first times how challenging and how important water security is to the nation's economy and to the nation's well-being. And as I said before, uh, the water quality issue is becoming increasingly impactful to our beaches, to our fish habitat, to our recreational and commercial uh, productions, not just along the coast, but within the riverine systems themselves. The Grand Challenges of the Mississippi uh, are illustrated here in 2011. Flooding on the main stem uh, made the, uh, led the Corps of Engineers to um, quote unquote operate the Bird Point floodway, where they for the first time uh, executed a series of explosions to open that up and alleviate pressure on the main stem Ohio. In contrast, just 18 months later, in November of 2012, that same stretch of river uh, was becoming increasingly challenging for uh, large uh, sections of our transportation sector, barge traffic to navigate upstream simply because the water had dropped too low and the channel had encroached upon by these rock pinnacles. Looking more recently, and one of the, what will be one of the focuses of the, Nash, of the uh, Innovators Program and the Summer Institute this year, the challenges of urban hydrology, urban flood uh, management, and urban water behavior are becoming increasingly illustrated. I mentioned Texas. Um, the, the images on the top left and top right are Austin, Texas, and Houston. I'm, I'm sorry, Houston and Austin, respectively. This was in early May of 2016. And by uh, late August, uh, areas where I had driven across to attend conferences just a few short months earlier were once again inundated and devastated by uh, 36 inches of rain that fell in the Amy River Basin in just one short weekend. These are becoming increasingly frequent, it's really much more impactful, and certainly challenged by the anthropogenic processes, the built environment. These are areas that, that the National Weather Service and NOAA's uh, flood information, flood tools, has struggled to really characterize and predict these types of floods. One of the themes of this summer's experiment will be exploring urban hydrology. How does water behave within the urban environment? And what are the glimpse ahead technologies that we can look at by working with academic sectors, by working with great graduate students and undergraduate students that we can envision em employing within our operations at the River Forecast Centers at the National Water Center sometime down the road. So I talked a little bit about who NOAA is and why the National Weather Service is part of it. Um, is recognizing that there are over 26 different federal agencies with the role of water. Uh, the uh, NOAA and our partners in the federal agencies uh, created something called the Integrated Water Resources Science and Services uh, uh, Consortium. This was done back in 2011 and was renewed in 2015. And what I, quite frankly, did not realize before I entered uh, the Federal Service uh, a number of years ago is just how unique and how special each role uh, the federal water agencies play. So the U.S. Geological Service maintains uh, almost eight, over 8,000 stream gauges across the nation. These are the real-time measurements of not just water volume, velocity, and discharge, but uh, also variables such as temperature, salinity, or water quality. Uh, I think everybody who's in an engineering program is well familiar with the Army Corps of Engineers. They manage our nation's water, provide security, uh, reduce flood risk, uh, lead the flood flight efforts, and energize the economy. Uh, both the USGS and, uh, and Army Corps of Engineers are core partners to the National Water Service. It was really in the recognition of, of the role that, we, that these three agencies play in the flood fight that, that IRIS was uh, first envisioned. And then in 2015, uh, because floods are so impactful um, and droughts are so devastating to the economy, uh, FEMA was brought on board, expressed an interest in joining, and came to the table, uh, and coincidentally at the National uh, Water Center, to join the Irish Consortium. And so what this group is is a series of federal agencies whose leadership agrees on the value of collaborating on water, providing resources, 
um, across the different federal agencies and committing to a shared vision and a shared mission. This is fairly unique. If, if you've worked with federal agencies in the past, they can appear to be stovepipes. IRIS is a way to break this down. And in fact, we benefit from this during the summer institute by having uh, colleagues from the uh, U.S. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers and USGS uh, participate in the training, the project development and execution, and the mentoring of students that participate in uh, in the summer institute. So it's a really wonderful opportunity, and uh, we have we specifically benefit from this here in the National Water Center, where we have not only um, NOAA and National Weather Service staff, we also have USGS staff on site to share their expertise and their experiences. Other partners who are not part of IRIS but who are essential to um, moving us in the right direction, it's certainly the National Science Foundation, um, through which much of the investments have been made to bring us to where we are today with cyber infrastructure. The capabilities uh, in the academic community have really been accelerated by NSF's vision, commitment to the future. And then the reason we're all here today is the Consortium of the Universities for the Advancement of Hydrologic Sciences Incorporated. My favorite six-letter acronym, uh, but also a steadfast partner in the execution, planning, and vision for the Summer Institute. So it really does take a, a multitude of federal agencies, um, organizations, science foundations, uh, and then also, most importantly, it takes folks like you, the, uh, the academic students. One of the first things that IRIS did is when they formed was to look across the landscape to survey our stakeholders and ask what the, the requirements were. And what we heard was uh, not surprising to uh, those of us who had worked in water resources. It's not just flooding. And certainly that's a major challenge. It's a major um, uh, adverse impact on the economy, on the safety of our citizenry. But it's also issues like water quality, water availability, drought and all of which are increasingly challenged by changing climate. Our stakeholders went further and said they needed integrated understanding of near-term and long-term risks. And they needed information uh, consistent, consistently developed and applied across the landscape and at high spatial and temporal resolution to really help them make the decisions. Uh, they wanted this information to be linked to impact, not just uh, how high was the water, was the water going to be, how little would there be in the channel, how much could this uh, add to or alleviate drought? But what were the infrastructural um, impacts? What were the economic impacts, demographics, environmental, other types of data that needed to be integrated? And then finally, um, across the board, we uh, embraced this concept of social science and making water and actionable intelligence. One of the most unique aspects of these innovators program and the Summer Institute is that we work alongside uh, first responders and emergency managers to really ensure that what we're prototyping, exploring, and developing is meaningful to those communities, the people who's, who are in the field, in the boats, in the first response vehicles, what types of information do they need to do to do their jobs, and what is the right mechanism in which to engage with them. So all of these are influencers not only on uh, what we look at in terms of NOAA's uh, strategic evolution and transformation of the water resources program, but it also influences how we approach and embrace uh, the Innovators Program in the Summer Institute. So this has led to uh, a high-level senior leadership embracement of change across NOAA and across the NOAA landscape. In 2016, our Undersecretary for Oceans and Atmosphere, Dr. Sullivan, really cemented this idea of a NOAA water initiative, building on some of the work that had been done by the National Weather Service on the partners with the IRIS uh, consortium to really expand water and the approach to water across uh, across all of the NOAA line offices. I mentioned earlier that, that the, NOAA has five line offices. The uh, NEDSIS, who does our satellite and information uh, and cl the climate research, the uh, Office for Ocean and Atmospheric Research, kind of the research heavy, uh, uh, heavy research side of NOAA. The National Marine Fisheries manages our fisheries in the saltwater environment and our National Ocean Service. Um, is uh, our uh, saltwater cousins along the coastal ocean estuaries of, of the nation and around the globe. Water cuts across all three, and certainly the National Weather Service uh, managing forecasting for not just severe weather, but hydrology, flash floods, floods and droughts uh, complement those capabilities. So the NOAA Water Initiative is user-inspired, user-oriented, interoperable, and agile, and it's focused on this notion of producing integrated water prediction and decision support tools, high-resolution information. Five key components of this, which we explore and endeavor to explore throughout um, the, the uh, Innovators Program, is integrated modeling and predictions. Some of the themes over the past couple of years have been on uh, different types of modeling platforms, linking to inundation mapping, 
The other components of the water initiative look at, at uh, expanded observations data, enhanced approaches to science, uh, research, and development. This notion of integrated decision support tools, embracing 21st technology, not just in terms of data services and cyber informatics, but also in terms of application development, apps, phones, uh, nibble and agile tablet-based websites. All of these are, are unique aspects that we can explore in an academic uh, type environment. And then finally, enhanced service delivery. What does it mean to uh, help somebody make a decision? And how we do that by inf infusing and making these processes be informed by social science. These are all components to what uh, NOAA as a water agency is one of 26 with the water mission uh, is struggling to, uh, or is striving to uh, explore, execute, and expand on our capabilities. I want to just share something that happened this year because it's going to inform what we do this coming summer. We had a series of water conversations. Uh, it was the first uh, in my career. They uh, had two regional, one national um, opportunities. It focused on uh, hearing from the stakeholders what they needed for water information, so improving access to water data, creating incentives for partnerships, building trust, uh, collaborating across federal agencies were all themes. Uh, we asked in the, some of these regional conversations, what were the pain points? Um, and certainly we heard back from them that it's not just enough to receive a forecast, but they needed the trust that they had with the river forecast centers um, to, to fully enable their service delivery mechanism. Of course, there are other notions of the, water, the NOAA water initiative that look at uh, strategic needs for high performance computing, for supercomputing environments. You know, many of us that are in the field today did not work on supercomputers when they were in their graduate programs or undergraduate programs. That's changing. That's profoundly uh, impacting how we do business within NOAA and across the federal agencies. And then there's a continued need for investment in atmospheric research and science. So this is the meat of why I give so much background on the policy and the progress within NOAA. In order to execute these transformations, we have uh, proposed and received funding for what we call strategic initiatives. The first was the centralized forecasting demonstration in which we um, proposed, uh, demonstrated, and executed the National Water Model. Ahead of this time, Dr. Maven uh, took the leap of faith to really help us uh, leverage existing uh, academic community approaches to continental scale hydrology and explore the notion of doing continental scale real-time simulations of the nation's water resources in the time span at which it was needed to execute in a forecast cycle. That was something we referred to as the National Flood Interoperability Experiment. One, it was, it was the first year of the Innovators Program and it resulted in a lot of really exciting uh, capabilities being brought up to the federal sector. One was a demonstration that this was simply possible, we could do this, but also that it needed a data model for organization around it. And that resulted in the notion of the NIFI framework for geospatial information, forecast information, and then linking that back to the emergency response community, completing the survey, completing the cycle. Inclusive in the centralized forecasting demonstration project is this also this commitment to data services, as well as evaluating and measuring what we do in order to transform our capabilities. I want to shift your attention to the middle column, and this is where we're really focusing in FY in this year's Summer Institute. The next step is to begin to explore the notion of hyper-resolution modeling. What does it mean to begin to attempt to characterize water within an urban environment? Can we do it? Um, certainly, it will be challenged to do that in a forecast uh, time scale, but can we do it with near-term observations of rainfall, observations of water elevation? Can we better estimate where water is and where it will go? Is it increasingly becoming a threat to infrastructure or is it abating? With that is the notion of exploring real-time flood inundation mapping. Uh, Dr. Maidman and a team from the University of Texas as well as the University of Champaign-Urbana led with what was I consider a, a hero lift last year with the, the application of the hand approach across the country. That work will continue to be pioneered and explored this year uh, in this year's um, Innovators Program at Summer Institute. And then the final aspect of this is how do we enhance this notion of impact-based decision support services? How do we get the information out? How do we as hydrologists and engineers partner with computer scientists, partner with social scientists, and get information in the hands of those that, that need it most to make their decisions. You know, everybody carries a, a cell phone around, a smartphone around in their pocket today, and there are technologies that are uh, readily accessible in the APIs of, of uh, Android and Apple that can greatly enhance how we do information. The federal government uh, has put a moratorium on development of applications, at least within the National Water Service, but working with academia, working with um, partners in the research community, 
we're a little bit uh, unconstrained from looking at that and exploring and seeing and demonstrating how that could be brought back to bear on these kind of community uh, grand challenges and uh, potential to turn those into grand opportunities. And in the out year, uh, potentially for future uh, instances of the Innovators Program, we'll look at coupling with the ocean, uh, coastal ocean and estuary processes, and look at service delivery not just for freshwater and river marine environments, but for coastal communities as well, for providing an integrated picture for water and water resources. So all of this is kind of a prelude to get to why do we do the Summer Institute. Well, quite frankly, I don't know how to enact this level of transformational change without embracing the youngest, the best, and the brightest. And that really is what this opportunity that we've created with the Innovators Program. We've done this for two years now. It's an engagement with the academic community that has two foundational goals. One is to provide a frame, framework for collaboration. And two, to target emerging technologies, things that your professors, that your departments are leading, uh, that may not in traditional pathways bubble up into the federal sector. In year one, uh, we had over 44 graduate students from 19 universities. As I said, Dr. Maven led the charge on simultaneously modeling the entire continental US on the National Hydrography Network, uh, developing that data model, and ultimately demonstrating that, yes, we can execute hydrologic simulations for 2.7 million regions. Much of this technology became the underpinning of the National Water Model, which we just recently implemented in 2000, on August uh, 16th of this year. Last year, as I said, uh, we focus on inundation mapping with participation from 34 graduate students from over 21 uh, universities. And this year, everybody participated and uh, was able to work alongside one another in the operations center of the National Water Center. Just for me, a really uh, uh, wonderful opportunity to share this 21st century building uh, with, uh, with students and, and potential um, future employees. So what is the National Water Center? Where will you, if you apply, um, and come down to join us for the Innovators Program? Where will you work? Well, this is uh, it, it's NOAA's uh, latest and greatest investment in, a, in infrastructure. It is a uh, 21st century, 65,000 square foot lead gold building located on the campus of uh, University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. Um, Tuscaloosa happens to be um, uh, a little bit warm, a little bit humid, but uh, the, the building itself is, is uh, incredibly uh, well and efficient in its air conditioning and air handling. Um, the, the, the role, the reason that we built this, uh, this facility, took advantage of the opportunity to do so, was to enable our systems modeling and brace geo intelligence. Uh, the water center will be a reach back capability for our river forecast centers. Uh, and most importantly to this activity, it's, it really is a catalyst for immigration. It's a, it's a, a multi-agency uh, facility located within an academic campus that provides an opportunity for unprecedented collaboration. Uh, we're still growing. We have 55 staff here uh, if our building that's uh, aimed at housing over 200. So it's an opportunity really now for us to use this space in a development and research capacity that may not be available to us in the, in the, fu in the future. I want to shift gears. Um, Oh, actually, I want my slides to advance. That would be nice. Hmm. I've got all types of technical difficulties. We'll go back to using the keyboard. I think that slide may have been struggling. So. Um, what is the National Water Model? The well, National Water Model is, like I said, built out of the, the work that we've done in previous institutes, but it's also a uh, collaboration that has been long ongoing with the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Uh, next week, I believe Dave Gotchelis will speak to the underpinnings of the model, so I'll speak to this at a very high level, um, recognizing that this was the manifestation of those requirements, the need for high resolution spatial and temporal information for water resources that complement the capabilities that are out there today. Um, like I said, it was implemented on August 16th, and it's a foundation for sustained growth and nationally consistent operational hydrologic forecasting capabilities. Um, sometimes folks ask us why we're doing this today. We have a rich and long history of doing uh, forecasts with our forecast centers. And the, what I like to answer them is that the, we're able to take this risk with the National Water Model uh, and to look at new types of technologies because we have a railroad that, that runs so well. We have a forecasting system that every year provides critical forecast uh, for the protection of life and property. 
I heard yesterday uh, something that I had not realized, that our colleagues at the Lower Mississippi River Forecast Center, and that forecast for the Amite River Basin when uh, thousands of people were displaced, many homes were flooded, transportation was disrupted, a major U.S. highway was closed, that they had over 72 hours of lead time that major flooding would take place in that basin. The reason that we're able to uh, take chances with uh, different types of modeling uh, capabilities is because we have a system that works and functions well at the river forecast centers. So by integrating not just uh, the new capabilities, but working with academia and working and bringing our development operations hydrologists on board from the river forecast centers, I truly believe that this is an opportunity for us to, to grow as a community, as, a, as a, a nation of water resources engineers and scientists, both governmental, academic, and private sector. Uh, it's an exciting opportunity for us to grow. And the National Water Model is just one of those tools that will emerge from this collaboration. At a very high level, um, the National Water Model is a physically based um, model based on the Work Hydro Framework, uh, supported by NCAR, uh, Earth Systems Modeling Compliant. It is a uh, numerical weather prediction model that's coupled with the land surface model. That land surface model has basic hydrologic modeling, both on a 250-meter grid uh, surface kinematic wave approach and subsurface on the uh, Buzinesque schema. Um, we route that water into the channel on the NHT plus catchment and then use that to um, move water from reach to reach using a commonly recognized topology, uh, topographic framework, topological framework for rivers and water bodies that's based not only on weather service information, but uh, leverages the EPA and USGS National Hydrography Data Set, a mutually agreed upon framework for describing water bodies uh, across the country. The water model uh, has uh, th four different uh, operational uh, configurations. Uh, we start with an assimilation cycle that picks up the zero precipitation. Uh, it takes into account uh, stream flow observations from 8,000 USGS stream gauges. and uh, it then couples with a short-range forecast based on the high-resolution rapid refresh, one of the many numerical weather prediction models that NOAA runs on our operational supercomputing system, and it runs out 15 hours in the future. Um, like I said, there's the one-kilometer one kilometer land model, 250-meter runoff model, and then reach-to-reach -reach routing with the NHG plus. This is complemented by the medium-range forecast that goes out to 10 days now based on the downscale global forecast system, another one of NOAA's uh, operational uh, numerical weather prediction models similar type of routing mechanism. And where we deviate a little bit from this, this process is as we look at the uh, long-range forecast, a 30-day cycle that kicks off once a day and has 16 ensemble members that looks at uh, water resources uh, applications, how much water is potentially coming out of uh, snow-driven basins, is it rising, uh, tailing off for dim snow accumulation season, are we looking at, uh, without uh, major rainstorms in the future, are we looking at channels uh, capacity decreasing to base flow? Those types of questions is really what this long-range forecast uh, placeholder is there, because certainly some of the um, skill in those in the numerical weather prediction models that force that are not quite up to speed. Again, that's an opportunity, not necessarily a criticism. And then within the model today, uh, but something that we will change in the future uh, and build out its capabilities in the future is the representation of uh, 1,260 water bodies, a very simplified level pool schema. But again, a placeholder, a, a way to expand and improve in the future. The uh, image on the top right illustrates the densification of information. Now, the red, red uh, symbols where we have forecast today are not the same as the blue dots where there's purely just a hydrologic guidance. But it is a densification, a complement to what information is out there, and a framework that we can improve upon information that's collectively available. Uh, the model outputs uh, discharge and velocity at 2.7 million reaches. Uh, there are reservoir inflow and outflow uh, for those water bodies in a very simplified fashion. And so the work that we're exploring now is what does this ponded water depth look like? Um, other water budget variables, the incoming fluxes, uh, the outgoing fluxes, you've got both uh, potential and Total example transpiration are available on one kilometer land surface, as are soil and snow, um, soil moisture and snow pack states. Um, we have uh, established basic data services. Um, there are data feeds uh, coming from raw model output guidance, not to be confused with forecast uh, data sets. There are raw model output guidance available on FTP servers. And we are working now with our river forecast centers as part of the evaluation of this modeling capability uh, to get the data into the hands of the men and women who actually turn the crank on the 
true operational forecast capability of the National Weather Service. If you look at the image on the left, again, this is just a densification scale. Each of these blue lines represents the river reaches in the National Hydrography Data Set, um, showing where we can get to in the future and how we can respond to those stakeholder requirements for enhanced and densified information. Um, finally, I want to uh, stop here with just an example of uh, what it means to begin to operate this type of model. Um, one of my colleagues, model uh, developer, uh, model project implementer, uh, really likes to use this frame hydroblind. And this is an example on the top right of an area where, after a large rain event in West Virginia, um, a roadway collapsed. Now that, that location is about 25 miles from the nearest uh, current forecast point. And so while we don't necessarily know exactly what the magnitude of the flooding was that overwhelmed this culvert and caused the bridge to collapse, for the first time, we're able to take information, objectively derived information, at, uh, at a series of points and begin to characterize the relative magnitude. Is it rising, is it dropping, and how high? I'm sorry, well, what rate is that happening? Uh, to begin to look at impacts on, on infrastructure. This is just the beginning. Um, in the bottom right, looking at the, this notion of what do we do with output, um, these, this is work that was done by some of our students last year to take output from the National Water Model, to take that initial inundation mapping and integrate that within a, a, within a very few short weeks, but integrate that within a viewer that they were able to use, communicate, and work with uh, social scientists to explore the, the wealth of that image. So that's what I pretty much had to present today. Um, it's a, this is somewhat bureaucratic and pedantic, and I apologize for that. But what I want to convey is that the federal landscape for water prediction is changing. But there are unprecedented opportunities in science um, and research, and the opportunity to translate that into the day-to-day -day, um, tools and decisions that, uh, that citizens make, as well as the tools and techniques that forecasters have to help those citizens is really exciting. Um, so we, I offer this as the beginning of the discussion on, on uh, the Innovators Program, and uh, hope that it, it at least doesn't bore you to death. Um, and entices you to, to join us to be part of this, uh, to work alongside some really talented folks, both here at the National Water Center, our colleagues from the River Forecast Centers, and just explore what 21st century hydrology and water resources prediction can look like. So I'll pause here, Liz. I don't know how many questions we had. Um, I'm going to minimize my screen. Um, if anyone has any questions, please type them into the chat box now, and then I'll read them off. Um, as of right now, we don't have any. But hopefully. Yeah. And, and yeah. I would just, uh, while, while folks are maybe formulating their questions, I would ask uh, Dr. Maidman to uh, to share his thoughts on this process and where we're going as a federal agency, where the academic sector is going, and perhaps reflect back on the last two years of the program. Um, hold on one second while I try to unmute him. All right, David, you're unmuted if you want to, you know, give your spiel. <laughs> okay, so, well, thank you so much, Ed. I really appreciate the, um, the presentation. And uh, do we open it up for questions at this point, uh, Elizabeth? Yeah, I can read off the questions. There are actually two right now. So the first one is from Ted, and he says, will this system allow for extensions by non-federal users? That's a great question. Uh, one of the things we're doing, and we're going to do this with um, participation, partnership with Quasi as well as other uh, groups and through NSF, is trying to establish a governance for how this can be a community model. Um, there's a notion out there of copy left versus copy right, and that's what we're trying to put in place so that we can engage all the academic partners with uh, working on this system, releasing, getting the source code out there, uh, and allowing uh, folks to uh, take advantage of that build upon it, uh, perhaps publish it back into the federal sector, or use it for other downstream applications. But um, the answer is yes. The mechanism of exactly how we do that um, has yet to be determined. But absolutely, we're committing to doing a transparent and community approach to uh, building out this model. All right, um, question from Brad. Can you, uh, can you speak to some of the funding opportunities that are available to the applied research community to partner with the NWC? Uh, yes, I can. So one of the opportunities today will be uh, uh, working with Quasi through this application process to uh, join, be, be a student at the Innovators uh, Program and the Summer Institute in, uh, in 2016, in, in summer 2017. 
um, I'm sorry, 2017, we just finished 2016. Um, that will be discussed forthcoming, at, I'm sure, by folks within Quasi. Uh, two opportunities that are, are uh, coming directly from the National Weather Service uh, and from NOAA. One is a, uh, there's a CSTAR grant that is on the street. If you go to uh, grants.gov and search for um, uh, National Weather Service, CSTAR, you should be able to find that. Otherwise, I will uh, share with Liz and link directly to that. Um, that's looking for very high-level, uh, detailed investigations and expanding uh, water modeling capabilities. And then at a slightly lower tier, uh, in the next uh, two weeks, the National Water Center, in collaboration with Comet, uh, one of the UCAR member institutions, will be announcing a series of small grants uh, for cooperators um, uh, and partner grants uh, for small-scale uh, research. And we certainly uh, encourage anybody interested in, in water modeling uh, to look at that announcement and request for proposals and see if some of their interests align with, uh, with some of our, our gaps and needs. Uh, again, I can share, once that one's published, I can share that with the quality community. Uh, they can post it on their, their website, and I'll do the same thing with the, the CSTAR uh, grant. Okay. Um, next one um, from Sam. Please elaborate on how you view social science integrated into the early stages of the model and approach. Well, that's a great question. One of the uh, first things, one of the things that we really did uh, with social science was to conduct those stakeholder engagements. We sit down with the, with the River Basin Commissions and their partners and ask them a series of questions about what information, what informatics needed, needs that they have. Um, how, not just, you know, not just what information do you need, but what are the types of decisions you make? That's one of the fields of social science that's beginning to infuse itself in um, how the National Weather Service conducts business. Uh, we've looked at, at social science um, applications that, that help us uh, ensure that we're delivering our message in the right way. What are the right schemas for presenting inundation maps, for example? What are the right color um, schemas to use? Um, I think th through Dr. Maven, I learned a very interesting uh, social science aspect, if you could refer to it as that, is that on maps that go into fire trucks, you don't put the color red because inside the fire truck, um, the cabs are all lit with red light. They're, you're using red lines, red letters, that would not, um, that would not be visible to the, to the first responder. Those are all aspects of social science. How do you communicate somebody's flood risk? How do you take something that's probabilistic in nature um, and make somebody who really is interested in a binary decision um, understand those complexities? Uh, social science and its application within um, water resources is an emerging field, and it's a really exciting one. So I don't have a fully detailed answer of, of every specific track that it could take, but um, it, it really doesn't take much imagination to see how we need to be asking ourselves not just about the physical science, but, but the social uh, component of how people interpret information. All right, next question is from Charles. Will NOAA fund private advanced satellite research? Uh, that's actually not something I deal with, but um, I, w I would hazard guess that uh, you would need to talk with MEDSIS on that on that subject. All right. The branch of satellite development. Um, next question is from Jeremy. Are you going to be uh, 3D temporal modeling watersheds? Doing, I guess, is what is missing. Are you going to be doing 3D temporal modeling watersheds? Uh, well, I'm not specifically familiar with uh, the, the, the term 3D temporal um, modeling, uh, watershed modeling. Uh, what we do uh, aim to do is fully physically based water models. Um, and when that gets into the channel and certainly within the coastal, within water bodies, um, along the coast periphery where uh, flow directions are both upstream, downstream, and then uh, within the vertical profile, uh, yes, uh, hydrodynamic models will be uh, incorporated in the national water model. Like I said, today it's very simplistic in its hydrologic applications. Uh, will grow to expand 1D, 2D hydraulic analysis. And as that water and those water quality issues um, become important along the coast, we certainly will leverage the expertise that's in our National Ocean Service. We're already today running three-dimensional hydrodynamic models to answer questions like salinity, salt intrusion, uh, salt wedge intrusion up channels to incorporate that or to support that in some fashion across NOAA's entire uh, suite. Um, next question is from Tim. Is groundwater derived base flow included in the modeled surface flows, and if so, how? So this is a very simplistic representation based on the NOAA MT um, uh, land model. I 
would be uncomfortable stating the specific uh, representation of the equations and how it's resolved, but it is just a one, it's a two meter representation of the soil column that does draw water through the soils, through the Buzinev routing uh, capability into um, you know, head-to-head -head calculations into the channel. It does not represent shallow water or deep water ground groundwater interactions. That is a no documented gap and one that we hope to address in future years of initiatives. All right, um, Sam asks, is there a network of local stakeholders who contribute to sensitivity analysis and, and ground choosing the predictions? Um, well, today there are a, a limited group of uh, regional uh, stakeholders. Uh, certainly uh, the river forecast centers, which are uh, geographically distributed across the, uh, across the U.S., mostly by river basin commissions, uh, they are internally evaluating the national water model. Um, this has been live for about 60 days, and we have a long ways to go as we evaluate it internally with our academic partners before we'd really want to um, take this out to the public and say, hey, here's something that we want your input on. Um, those days are coming, uh, but right now we're doing it through our forecast centers and uh, allowing, relying on their expertise and their partnerships when to socialize and what aspects of the National Water Model to socialize. All right. Um, Chuck says, very interesting presentation. Uh, read the spatial co um, coverage, your slide, National Water Model version 1.0 output. It shows CONUS coverage. Is there linkage to Hawaii, Alaska, and to transboundary catchments such as Columbia River, Yukon River, Red River? That's an excellent question. Uh, and if my colleague Scott Lindsay, who's the hydrologist in charge up at Alaska, would say that it's not truly a national water model. Uh, there are OCONUS contributions to the National Water Model represented in version one, the Columbia River Basin and the, uh, the, um, the, the portion of the lower Rio Grande that can, that's in Mexico that is represented, as are smaller portions of the milk um, and sewers in um, the northern tier of the U.S. There are some challenges in those areas and how they're represented in the National Hydrography data set. We are partnering with the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab, GLORAL, another NOAA uh, research entity to build out the hydrography network in the Oconus regions of the Laurentian Basin. Um, but with re in regards to Hawaii and Alaska, um, the, we have a project in place right now uh, implementing, uh, exploring the implementation of uh, the water model over Hawaii. Um, there is a, re a very early research version running with um, with our colleagues at the Alaska Pacific River Forecast Center uh, and their partners in, in Hawaii. Uh, in, with regard to Alaska, we're a couple years away from that simply because we do not have the underlying hydrography network, that geospatial framework for characterizing the rivers has yet to be developed for Alaska. Uh, NOAA and the National Water Service hope to accelerate that process in partnership with the USGS, but as that is a critical dependency for the model of sensation, we're not there yet. All right, um, Young Yun's wondering which model method is used for this national water model, um, EG, CIC, NOAA MP, LSM, et cetera. It's NOAA, it's NOAA MP. Um, so there's a lot more questions. All right. <laughs> Lao Fan says, um, she has re uh, several relevant questions. How are stream flow observations assimilated into the national water model? And then I'll just read the rest of it. Variational or ensemble-based method. What state variables are updated in the model? Are there papers or reports describing data assimilation procedure in the model? In the current WARP Hydro download page under NCAR, is the data assimilation capability included? I used WARP Hydro version 2, but I did not remember that WARP Hydro has the capability of data assimilation. Okay, so I'm going to um, do what uh, most politicians do uh, and punt on this, but I will answer it in a very high level before I do that. My punt is to say tune in next time when Dr. David Gotchis will discuss um, detailed aspects of the National Water Model, including the version, the current updated version of the Warfighter Framework, which will be documented and available uh, from NCAR at some point in the, in the future. Uh, the, the answer, the short answer to this is that data simulation is uh, solely uh, restricted to stream flow, to discharge values collected from USGS gauges that are um, assimilated into the, into the operational supercomputer through uh, access from the uh, National Water Information System, the NWIS system. So that's where we get it, we pick it up, and it's a very simple nudging method to adjust uh, stream flow uh, states, no other land surface states or snow states. 
uh, within the channel uh, and apply a weighting factor to that for future temporal time steps, really to bring the water, the, the water level, or the water discharge value in line with um, where the uh, where the, the simulation in line with where the observation is. It's a very crude approach, but that data simulation component of the National Water Model is one in which we are making tremendous um, investments. And I would defer to uh, next week when Dr. Gosh is available to join us and describe the specific um, data simulation packages that are being uh, used today in their development and also being envisioned for use in the future. All right, um, another one from Sam. Based on your initial runs, is Storm Surge integrating well with other model plugins? Uh, so right now, the version of the National Water Model does not include any Storm Surge. Um, so that's a initiative that will be uh, undertaken in coming years. Um, would not be able to answer that question directly. Okay. Um, Madeline says, have you considered adding the capacity to include citizen ob observations through apps that are being developed? So that's an excellent question, Madeline. Um, the, that's something we really, those are the types of questions we really like to explore during the Summer Institute. Um, uh, so the answer is yes, we've considered it, only because uh, the first year of the NIFI, some of the students with a couple weeks to go um, did a really interesting project where they were taking photos, uh, so, uh, crowdsourced photos from social media of ongoing flooding in Texas. And they were taking those photos of, of flooding and established the watermark with Google Street View, and then back calculating out the polar metric uh, coordinates of that scene and estimating inundation and potentially mapping that inundation beyond the peripheral view of the, the Street View camera. It was a really exciting uh, project. They did it. They executed it with a couple weeks to go. It's a proof of concept. But that's the type of um, that's the type of kind of social media uh, visualization uh, application development that really excites me uh, about the Summer Institute, and certainly would be a wonderful topic to expand on um, this year is what what does citizen science tell us about uh, about the model and what can be used as uh, either information that can be assimilated or what can be used as uh, information to be validated and verified against. That's a great question. All right. Um, it looks like there are no more questions. Um, so I think we can start wrapping it up. Or <coughs> Ed, could I ask a question here, um, a little bit more philosophical kind? You know, looking back on, I, I was just thinking that two years ago when we were starting up this process, even the whole idea that you could calculate flows all across the country was seemed still quite a stretch into the future. You know, this is only two years on. And this, a lot has happened in the last couple of years. Can you reflect a little bit on what are the milestones, what are the things that you remember as you know, particularly striking about that progress? Uh, well, nice. gosh, I, mean, you know, I haven't reflected on that such a compressed uh, time schedule. I, you know, I, I think back on um, one that we, in the lead up to the first uh, instance of the Summer Institute, the success that uh, Dr. Uh, Fernando Salas and uh, Mercedes Moreno uh, did with just getting the Warfighter code up and running every hour on the supercomputer at University of Texas there. I think that was a, a, was a groundbreaking um, uh, capability. I know there were a lot of very, very long nights and, and short periods of sleep that got them there. Uh, the second component of that was um, the ability uh, for our, our partners at, at Deltares to support a data service that collected um, all of the uh, five different time series um, from the River Forecast Centers in an internal uh, non-standard format and provide that back to the students in the WaterML 2.0 format uh, for use in their research and comparisons and validation studies. So, the implementation of the of the National Water of, of the Warp Hydro Framework got stampeded, uh, coupled with that uh, that investment made by uh, made by uh, Del Torres. And then the third piece that I think that's continued to carry forward is the adoption and the demonstration that we can use the National Hydrography data set as uh, an interagency standard in describing water movement, water channels across the country. That's, that's the other one that really really strikes me as being foundational. Thank you. Um, well, on behalf of us all, thank you so much for opening the doors to enable us to work with you on this, Ed, and thanks to your colleagues also. I mean, this is a really unique opportunity to for the academic community to be able to contribute to the advancement of the nation as a whole, and we really appreciate uh, having the chance to do that.
Well, I'd turn that around, David, and say we really appreciate the academic community um, taking a risk with the federal government, um, working with bureaucrats, uh, and, uh, and coming to the table and, and being truly a partner. So um, I'm looking forward to this coming year's uh, Summer Institute. I'm reflecting back on the June and July time frame here um, in Tuscaloosa. It was the best part of my year. And I'm, here, I'm positive that next year, uh, those seven weeks will also be the best part of 2017. And just as a thought for faculty around the country, I spent quite a bit of time in Tuscaloosa this past summer working with the students. And it was, I felt like I sort of had a mini sabbatical leave. So if you have the feeling like you want to sort of ventilate your mind a little bit and, and, and help us out or join us in this activity, you're very welcome to uh, consider that. I had a little apartment in the student accommodations in Alabama, and I spent quite a lot of time there. So um, this is, you know, we're focusing on student activities, but we very much want to involve faculty and faculty advisors and have them coming to Tuscaloosa as well. So this is meant to be a community-wide activity, and, uh, and we want to engage everybody as much as possible. So thank you so much. All right, and just a reminder that we do have two more uh, webinars as part of the series. Uh, next week will be Dave Gostas, and he will be presenting on the technical overview of the national water model. And all talks are at 3 o'clock uh, p.m. Eastern time. And then also, we have Quasi does have a few deadlines coming up. So if you're interested in either applying for the Graduate Student Pathfinder Fellowship, the deadline is October 14th. And then we do have a Let's Talk About Water Challenge grant that's due November 4th. Okay. Thanks so much, then, Elizabeth. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks, Liz. Bye-bye.